Hello, this is Jeremy Faust, Medical Editor-in-Chief of MedPage Today. Thank you for joining us. We're joined today by Preeti Christel, a health justice lawyer. She's the co-founder and co-executive director of IMAC, Initiatives for Medicines, Access, and Knowledge. This is a nonprofit that works on equitable medicine systems and patents and issues surrounding that. Preeti Christel is also the recent recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's dive into your work and what you do. Obviously, COVID changed everything in terms of how we, I spend my time and to some extent how, how you spend your time, I imagine. Can you tell me how we are doing in terms of your area of expertise and interest, which is patents and sharing of information so that everybody has access to, to life-saving uh, therapeutics and vaccines? How are, how are we doing uh, compared to a year or two ago? Mm. You know, in some ways, uh, my work is on systems change, and uh, not a whole lot has changed. We still live in the same system where when a pandemic hits, some people are going to get medication first, some people are going to get testing or vaccines first, and some people aren't going to get it at all. And that's just the reality. I think the hope that I saw through COVID, though, was how many people mobilized to change that situation, how many people um, became awake to understanding that the system is actually designed to serve commercial interests first and not to serve equitable access. So we now have thousands of people who have joined the access to medicines movement who weren't part of it before, which is really beautiful. I want to address the idea of patents being a problem because you're in, in a way you sort of come at it from someone who might have been predisposed to not think so, right? Based on your background. Tell us a little bit about how you how you started. Yeah, I grew up um, as the daughter of a pharmaceutical scientist. You know, we used to talk about science every day at the dinner table. And I grew up with a reverence really for finding cures, for patents as an instrument of really showing that you had achieved a big milestone. Um, that's what it was for me growing up. I decided to go into health law and I became a legal aid lawyer to work with communities living under the poverty line. And when I was doing that in the early years as a lawyer, I came to realize that part of the reason that medication was unaffordable or inaccessible was because of the way the patent system was actually being gamed. And so it was a big aha moment for me. Um, I was in the early years where I met my co-founder, Tahir Amin, and he was a patent lawyer and sorry, an intellectual property lawyer who had come over from the private sector. And I was working um, in legal aid and my office's clients were people living with diseases who couldn't afford their medication. And so we teamed up to sort of investigate the problem and realize that IP was at the heart of it and that the system was being used for purposes that it wasn't intended for. And I've heard you speak a lot on these issues. And one thing that always gets asked, I will ask it again, is, is really about whether there's sort of a, um, a, whether you make a distinction between situations in which a, a private company received government funding. In other words, it, mm -hmm. the, venture, the venture risk capital was actually taxpayer driven. That's right. Um, and then, and those who didn't. So in other words, there's always a concern that the risk is is public, but the reward is private. And so okay. Do you make a distinction when there are companies that haven't uh, necessarily received tons of government funding in terms of like what they owe the rest of the world? So I think it depends on the situation. What we saw with COVID, for example, in the case of Moderna, was that Moderna received nearly 100% of its funding was government funding. And the government didn't keep any of that return on investment. So we're in a position today where Moderna is on track to make $40 billion by the end of this year. They're predicted to have $100 billion in market cap in the coming years because they're taking that technology, which was taxpayer funded, and they're applying it to other disease areas, and they're going to make a whole lot of money. And so what we always say is that there's not an investor alive who would take a bet like that. And yet the federal government keeps using our dollars in this way. Um, and the situation could have looked very different, where if the government had retained some rights in that proprietary technology, it could have decided how to deploy that technology worldwide and how to use it to save more lives. And so I think when it comes to public funding, there's a need for a real paradigm shift. Would you say like a better deal would be 
I'm just spitballing here. Like, okay, we will give you the research and development money. The NIH will pay for that. And, mm -hmm. and the first $10 billion of profit is yours. But after that, because uh, we've got to split it or we've got to take this portion and put it back into, into investing in, in people uh, who paid for this, including people who don't have access to it. Would you support some kind of system like that? Yeah, that's a great idea. I think the money is one issue and definitely taxpayers should get a return on their investment. So something like what you're proposing sounds good. I also think there is the matter of whose technology is it then? Because if the federal government had access to it, it would be able to deploy it. What we saw happen during COVID is that um, Moderna kept claiming that companies in other countries did not have capability to make vaccines. And now we all know that's not true. Studies have come out showing that, you know, doing supplier landscapes, showing how many companies could have been up and running um, if Moderna was willing to share knowledge and share its IP. And so I think that kind of thing, the money is one dimension of it that's important. We should make sure that Moderna is rewarded for the work that it did and the technology and the sharing of knowledge is the other piece. You talk to governments, you talk to officials, leaders, do they do they do they have a sense that what you are proposing isn't just humanitarian, but actually just is actually in a national security interest for us? In other words, like nobody's safe until everybody's safe. Do they understand that? That's been a tricky question during COVID. I think there was um a significant uh base of support that got activated, including world leaders around that idea. Um, but it never quite caught on here in the US, that deeper understanding that we actually aren't going to be able to take on and prepare for pandemics as well as we could by taking care of the rest of the world. Uh, and so that I think is going to be a major challenge that we're going to have to figure out how to solve for in the coming years. And Moderna had said in the past that they wouldn't be really enforcing their patent during the pandemic. Um, how's that playing out? Yeah, that that's tricky. You know, we've seen that language in prior pandemics before. Um, I think the devil's really in the details on that one. You know, you may not enforce some of your patents. You may enforce other IP. What does it mean to be during the pandemic? Is the pandemic over? Um, and it's very... Uh, it's up to the initiative of the company in that case. And I think what we've seen with voluntary actions by the pharmaceutical companies over the last two decades with HIV, with hepatitis C, is that you actually need a system. It can't be up to the individual goodwill of the companies because it's not going to get us as far as we need to go in terms of health outcomes. Your, your audience is often, again, governments, leaders, people who um, come in all varieties of political bent. Do, do you ever get the feedback, oh, this is just anti-capitalist? Yeah, I think there's people who think that when they read or hear about the work secondhand, usually when people meet us, they don't walk away feeling that. For example, our work in the United States, we've been doing a series of investigations over the last four years called Over Patented, Overpriced, where we've systematically been able to show that there's, so on Wall Street, they call it the patent cliff. It's the point at which patents on a drug are supposed to expire and competition is supposed to enter the market. And our investigations have really revealed that companies are not only filing dozens or even hundreds of patents on the top selling drugs, there's a sharp acceleration um, post FDA approval and before the patent is supposed to expire so that that exclusivity period or that monopoly can be extended out as far as possible. And it's costing us hundreds of billions of dollars as a country. And I think that um, body of research and that education work we've been able to do, um, our message is not, oh, we shouldn't be giving out patents at all. Our message is something's gone off the rails here. And you know, you know, Jeremy, like, Prescription drug spend is poised to reach like a trillion dollars, they're saying, by 2030. Well, let's look at where a lot of this cost is coming from on prescription drugs. And so we're saying we need some regulation to correct for what's happening in order to be able to ensure that competition enters the market in a timely way. Do you think that there's some problem with the pharmaceutical companies essentially replacing their old compound with a new one, and the new one might work? 2% better, but it costs a thousand times as much. 
And, and in reality, if, if nobody wants to say, oh, we should give the thing that's sort of off patent, that's 98% as good because everyone deserves the best. But in a way, it's almost like it's, it's the problem that we, we keep creating medicines that are much, much more expensive than they are in terms of the, the, the in incremental benefit that they give us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some really great experts out there who talk about this issue. Um, from my perspective on the patent side, I definitely think we're seeing a lot of patenting activity where even that marginal benefit to the patient doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing right. um, just the proliferation of patents that look different and feel different, but it doesn't necessarily add value. Um, and it becomes part of what we call a patent thicket which it's not that each patent in the thicket necessarily has that kind of value for the patient, but because they're amassing so many, like for example, in the case of Humira, I think they filed for over 300 patents. They've gotten 166 to date. When you have that many patents, it's just a deterrent to competitors mm. to want to enter, to take on the risk of being litigated against or, you know, so, um, the question you raise is important is like, what are we rewarding? And from the patent perspective, I would say we're rewarding a whole lot less with a whole lot more. Because what we're seeing is the amount of money you can make in the case of, let's say, Humira again, you know, in the years that drug was supposed to come off patent, the Europeans saw competition starting in 2018. We're not going to get competition until next year. Now, this is after the initial set of patents expired. They're making two thirds of their U.S. sales during this time period when Europeans have already gotten competition. That's a hundred billion dollars they're poised to make during this time. And so, again, it just goes back to this idea of what are we actually rewarding? Are we incentivizing the right thing? Mm -hmm. And in terms of what physicians or physician leaders can do, because that's really this audience, obviously there's advocacy and there's knowing this stuff and, and there's education that they can have and I can have. I looked at your website. You have an amazing tool showing just you know who owns the patent, how much has the price gone up. I really yeah. encourage people to check out, check that out because it's, it's eye-opening. But is a lot of the answer also sort of in our physician hands where it's what we decide to put on formulary? Because if, if mm -hmm. we decide, look, we're just not going to spend... Um, this much money for something that doesn't even really benefit the patient other than some trial that was really designed to show some tiny little incremental thing. Mm -hmm. is, can, can we really make a difference on that? Or is it more like, okay, this is a legal sort of political battle and physicians are essentially pawns? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's both. Um, one of the examples that comes to mind is when drugs are going off patent, for example, in Europe, but we're getting a delay, you know, I think this happened recently on both Xarelto and Eliquis, um, the cardiovascular drug, uh, they do a strategic patent filing, and then they delay the, t you know, the moment when competition should be entering. It's patients who are feeling that, right? Providers are on the front lines to be able to see, wait, Copays were supposed to come down. People were supposed to be able to get, you know, choice in what they're going to take. And so I think lending um, your voices to the overall call for patent reform becomes very important because you all understand the real impact on patients' lives when that happens. All right. Well, you're doing important work. We support you. It's provocative. It's uh, forward thinking. Thank you so much for joining us on MedPage today. Thank you, Jeremy.